Hello and welcome back to the second half of the TT Podcast with Ian Hutchinson. If you've not listened to part one, make sure you go back on whatever app you listen to your podcasts on. Make sure you check it out because I don't even know where to start. I can't believe how bad he was on a flipping road bike. <laughs> can't drive, can't even ride a bike. <laughs> hey, somehow... if you're not crashing, you're not trained. Uh, <laughs> That's that, something that, like that. that yeah. Yeah. Right. You were trying hard. <laughs> So we uh, we ended part one just as we arrived at the start of your your TT career. So let's get into it. Two thousand and eight, you two were actually teammates. So Steve, what did it feel like having this upstart popping in? Yeah, I don't. Pff. AIM Yamaha, a guy called Alistair Flanagan, who was actually spectating this year at yeah, the TT. Same, Alistair same, yeah. and Gail, his lovely lovely other half was there. Yeah, um, a good guy, really. You know, um, he he funded the team. Uh, a good effort, you know, and. Uh, I was running. Was it? Was we both running at British Championship as well? Uh, we yeah, were on, sport, on, yeah. On in the Super Sport Championship, yeah, and that, that was you know really good bike. Uh, a guy called Steve Meller, the old M out of V and M, um, built the engines that were really really fast. And the R six back then, the Yamaha was a little bit. Um, it could throw a valve, couldn't it? So a bit a bit unreliable. Man and stuff, could, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, actually, <laughs> at so, TT, so one, I, of, one of the team riders I, I, were very lucky. I, <laughs> <laughs> I had a spare engine, right? I had a spare engine, brand new, and I, so I lent it to Uchi because rather than him having a, uh, another used engine, and, it, and that blew up as well. <laughs> Is that because you were pushing too much harder than he was? No, I've never had it with any other team. <laughs> it was about as I think I think the engine was about as reliable as as Uchi's road riding. <laughs> mm-hmm. But so, yeah, no teammates met yet, yeah, and. Um, you know, obviously it was uh, my my second TT then, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, it was alright. It's good for me, really. I just sort of did my own thing, and for me, you know, on the super bike was really hard work. I thought, you know, really hard work. I used mm-hmm. to dance all over the road and was quite frightening. Yeah. Mm. How was it for you, Uchi? Yeah, it was. Um, I can't like totally remember coming into the team and sort of meeting Steve for the mm. first time. I don't, I don't think we really did any Spanish testing or anything, did we? I don't remember any of that. Don't think so. No. I don't remember too much of the year, but um, it didn't go very well for me, I know that much. <laughs> I think, like, the team... Were you, were you with them the year before? On Yeah, bits and bobs, on and off, yeah. Some Somebody, I think Coops or somebody was injured, I can't think who it was, somebody had been injured or, or wasn't doing very well, and I jumped in and did a few races and won a few, and that's what gave me the ride in the following yeah. year, yeah. Yeah, I think, and you were going to be a newcomer at TT that year as well. Uh, no, oh seven was I was newcomer ah, centenary, so, second year, yeah. so it's my second year, yeah. Yeah, I think um, Alistair was obviously a mega valuable sponsor and team for motorcycle racing, running his ETI thing and then the AIM thing, and um, you know a great guy. I still believe that the team were very well set up to run one rider and probably especially not at the level we both wanted to be at to run us both as good as what we both wanted to be doing I think mm-hmm. you know there was no clash between me wanting to be a number one rider or anything that never even came into med back then um but it definitely got stretched especially with the roads thing when we needed to run yeah. more bikes and I ended up building my own stock I don't know if you ran a stocker that year did you I don't think you did yeah I did but I think it's a private I, I ran it through somebody else yeah I think it was through it. uh phase one Ah, uh, yes. I think, I think, yeah. Yep. Yes, we both had to get our own stockers. And, yeah, I mean, it had its little flashes. I, I'll never forget a 600 race we had at the North West. We had this conversation this year because you never see a bike, like, disappear at North West. And me and Steve must have been 10 seconds ahead of everybody <laughs> on these 600s, miles ahead. And we come out of Macroboy going up the hill on the last lap. Side by side, he looked across at me. Guess whose bike shit itself. <laughs> <laughs> what so, uh, some people say you make your own look <laughs> water hose came off so it's not down yeah. to riding it <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and then um tt just like you couldn't have made it up for my side my super bike set on fire in the tent in practice week oh, that's right i, yeah. I, I just stormed that. off and said i'm off home I'd like it, it just gone that bad i just thought i'm not meant mm. to be here and then mcginnis actually come chasing after me and he's like, get on your 600, you're riding it week in, week out, just go out and have some fun. And I was like, no, I'm going home, I'm going home. I was like, come on, just come back, it'll be all right. So anyway, I jumped on the 600, nearly crashed at Greba Castle, the back tyre was flat. It was proper like, I was so close to going home. Anyway, we carried on and then uh, I think out of the, what was the four races then, not five, I think yeah. it was only one 600 race, I only finished two. 
first superbike race, they had to put oil in in the pit stop because the bikes were burning that much oil. Were they? <laughs> so we never knew, well, I never knew this till race day. And there's this massive quick fill thing, which you've probably seen before with World Endurance. Yeah. I've never seen it. That goes on the oil filler. Anything oil related worries me a bit, TT. Oh, yeah. So when I turned up on the line and seen this thing, I was like wanting to know what was going on. And anyway, I got bollocked and told to show up and we're going to put some oil in your bike at pit stop and it's used in World Endurance, blah, blah. Anyway, came into the pit stop, put some oil in, set off down rail, pissing oil out everywhere, retired. When they pulled the quick fill back out, just pulled the whole filler thing out. So, so there's, there's no, no cap. So, yeah, my argument was that we should have been trying stuff like that in practice week, not foot race. But anyway, Absolutely. that was that one. And then uh, you must have finished that race, can't remember. And the 600... No, there was two 600 races. There was. The first one I blew up. Yeah. And then the second one you blew up. That's right. Yeah. Up, up on the mountain, I was yeah. second in the second one, I think, to Bruce. And then in the senior, I finished there. Did you maybe not finish the senior either? Yeah. I finished super out races. I won the super sport yeah. when Bruce was kicked out yeah. uh, for a, for that a problem. That was the first one. Uh, which was the first race, and the second one I blew up on the mountain. And then the super out, I think I finished them both. Hmm. But it was really physical. I was I was nowhere, well, not top 10, but I mean, not where you wanted to be. And, and really struggled. Yeah, really struggled on my big bikes. Yeah. Yeah, so then it didn't get much better when I came back. And uh, nearly crashed at Knock Hill in morning warm up in the wet. Lich, the rear come round to me. I went sideways down the first turn there. It's like I knew something wasn't right. Came back in, checked the pressure, 58 pace, signed a back tyre. I just went back to the motor and packed in, rung Alistair, said, I'm not riding the bikes anymore. And we're supposed to go straight from there to the Ulster. Yeah. So the Ulster organisers were like, Oh, I need you to come out, I need you to come out. So I said, I am not riding those bikes, road racing. That was that, you know. So they got Rob Mack to bring some bikes out for me. So I got so, Carl Harris's yeah. super bike, and I think it's probably at the time Billy McConnell 600 yeah, or something like been, that. Yeah, would have been, yeah. So, yeah, I went out there, and this, yeah, my team's there with two bikes. I was like, oh, my God, I can't wait. And it all got cancelled. It got flooded out. Yeah. Never oh, raced. Yeah. Well, I'm doing a bit of a disservice here because, obviously, you, 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 you got your first win in 2007. I mean... We could spend a, an hour talking about every single year that you've raced, yeah. but there are there are bits that I, I can't. I don't want to spend too much time talking about the injuries and whatnot. But it's it's part of your career, it's part of your life. But what did that first TT win feel like? It, it looking back now, it seems like life was so much fun racing <laughs> <laughs> because we went to the obviously came into HM Plant on the team as John McGuinness's teammate. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was I just had my success on the McAdoo bikes, and I was happy you know i loved riding there but then i got this offer with the honda thing and a, a salary and everything i was like got you know you've got to go there and uh came in as john's teammate and i was doing british super sport as well um and yeah we went to the northwest i'd crashed i clipped a back marker going down cascades at ulton park on the bank holiday monday and we were at the northwest on the tuesday and i went down there end over end and hurt my shoulder I did something to my shoulder can't remember exact, exactly what so I couldn't lift my arm up at all. And Tuxford had said, if you have to have any pain clean injections, you're not doing the Northwest. I was like, oh, there's no way I can miss this. This isn't my big chance yeah. with Honda. You know, I'm not going to miss the roads. So I got up at half five, six o'clock, went and saw the doctor. I had a cortisone injection in my arm on race day, this was. And I, every time I got on the bike on the grid, I had to walk to it from the front of the bike, get all the handlebar from behind, and then walk, walk around and get my leg over because I couldn't have got my hand up to the bar otherwise. And I didn't want to go like that in front of everybody. <laughs> So once I was on, that was it. That I never left that bar, and I had a pretty average northwest. And uh, I remember the last 600 race, I was going around the Magic Roundabout, and Neil was rushing for a flight, so he'd gone to watch at the Magic Roundabout, and so he could get out after it for his flight, and wrote a road all the way around the outside around the Kawasaki. And Tux had seen it, like, but I couldn't even. My, I had no strength to hold the bars up. So yeah, and then we went from there. What was that rotator cuff? Shoulder injury. I never really got told what it was. Yeah. I just, yeah, I went into gravel with my arm out, I think, and just yeah, shoved it, it back. It was 100%. And, I've done it oof, twice. Yeah. Just could not lift my arm from my side. Yeah. So then the TT was back to back. So I went straight, me, Rutter, McGuinness, Motorhomes, straight to the Isle of Man, parked up on the Monday. And we literally got drunk every single night <laughs> from Monday to Friday. <laughs> went and got scooting here on Saturday and did the first night of practice Saturday night. And, uh, 
John did the first ever 130 lap. I won my first TT. We were both on the podium for every single race. I remember being on the podium for the senior sprint champagne, which I was just like, my God, life couldn't get any better. I was like, we were yeah. the only two riders to podium every single race, and we'd just come there and got leathered for a <laughs> week. <laughs> That's just, I, yeah, I could probably have done better <laughs> if I hadn't gone leathered. But <laughs> or I might do better now if I start getting leathered. <laughs> One of the ways around. That's it, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it just seems to have got more and more serious ever since then. I'm not sure whether you would do better if you carried on like that or not. <laughs> Is it, what, the, the whole thing or your attitude or everybody else's attitude around to try and get that win? British Championship definitely changed. Like, people don't drink in the paddock now. You know, if you go back even before my time, I think you have probably saw the back end of it, but in the 90s, I know Jim Moody talks about, on a Sunday night, the whole paddock stayed behind and drank on a Sunday night. Yeah, that's right. Parties, yeah, you know, yeah. Everyone's gone before, like, minute races but finished. 90s, we, you was at it every night. Yeah. In in town, clubbing, club, you know, it's just, it was a done thing. Yeah, yeah. The same with the Macau job, you know, um, that that was always like a holiday race and you went and got, yeah, obviously you wanted to do well in the race, but everyone on the grid was like dripping vodka out of the <clears> brows. So it, didn't, it was just who did the best, you know, feeling a bit rough. <laughs> yeah. And then Steve came and never drank all week and won, <laughs> so we all had to stop. Oh, so you spoil it, you spoil <laughs> the spoil party. <laughs> and then a lot more after me. Yeah, yeah so that took, that took the shine off it there for a bit. <laughs> Could only do two days of drinking <laughs> yeah. to stop. <laughs> No, but I mean, oh, we had so much fun out there. Me and John have just like pretty much everywhere we go, I just click with John and we just do stupid things. And we, we almost have our own language for stupid words. We talk about stuff and how we explain things. Yeah. And yeah, so we, we were in a club once there, it was an underground D2, DD2 yeah. or something, underground club. It's in Macau. Yeah, we had fire, fire. I mean, it sounds mega childish to hear somebody saying, oh, obviously letting fire extinguish off. But in this nightclub, it's just. John tried to get me with one of those reeled up big red hoses, water hoses. <laughs> now the tap on the wall that he unscrewed, it had obviously not been unscrewed all its life, so it wasn't like just coming on gradually as you unscrewing it. It wasn't coming on. I come out of the toilet and facing it to me. So I sort of like ran to him, so he dropped it. I picked it up and there's like saloon doors back into it. Club one was propped open. So I grabbed this thing to do it to Obviously the half turn I give it, it just went Ooh, <laughs> full jet mode. <laughs> The jet, he's like drenched, jumped out of the way. It's firing into the club. I've got to turn it off. I've got to go all the way back in to get it to stop. Put it on the floor, come through the door, and John's just stood there dripping. And what was holding the door up? A powder fire extinguisher. So I just obviously thought he needs a little, a little with that, doesn't he? Because he's wet. Picked it up. It had about that much flex on it, and then a cone pulled the pin out. I was literally going to go and put it down. Once you've done that, that's it till it's empty. I never knew that. <laughs> so I've given him a... Ch I'm like... Oh. So I just sat it on the floor and it's going like... It's full in the club. <laughs> it takes all the oxygen out there. Yeah. So no Is one it? could breathe. Dust, you couldn't see. Music stopped. There's a lot of people. There must be 100 people in here. And that, like Everyone's just like lost in this cloud. I've gone to the bar and it started to settle down. E literally every glass bottle, everything's white. <laughs> and Blandy, our mate Blandy's there. He's got his T-shirt. He's going, he's going, the building's flying down. Because underneath, he thought the building was coming down. I couldn't stop laughing to tell him what's going on. And then there were some saloon doors that went out of the club. They're like escalators coming in it. Saloon doors going out of the club. Next minute, McGuinness boots them up and comes in, white as a sheet, wet through. And the bouncers wore all white clothes there. Do you remember? They like, looked like surgeons. <laughs> so this bouncer, little Japanese kung fu fighter, spotted John and just thought, you're the cause of all this. Just give him a massive dig straight to his chin. <laughs> so McGuinness got a bit angry and he's like, like shouting and bawling. And he's like, let's go. We tried to run out of there and there was like steps and escalator, but the escalator was only coming down. Couldn't go up the steps. There's like six of these white guys coming down, bouncers. So I'm trying to run up the step, the staircase. <laughs> McGuinness is like, I can't run. <laughs> We get us outside, and then Ian Locker's getting a kick in for no reason off somewhere. Absolutely leathered he was. And we, it was the last night we were going to Thailand. We were supposed to be packed and out the hotel at half seven. It was half seven. We're just coming out of this nightclub. Brilliant. So there's a McGuinness one side of Locker, me the other side, car carting him back. We walked into the hotel, and Mike Trimby and his wife were there organising the bags <laughs> for Thailand. Just looked up at us, just shook his head, and went, you've got five minutes. <laughs> Like, Locker's got blood coming down his nose. McGuinness is white as a sheet. 
So quickly got changed straight on the uh, yeah, bus yeah. and flight over to Thailand, <laughs> which is another story again. Like, but... <laughs> right, do we want to hear about yeah. 2010 TT or do we want to hear about Thailand now? <laughs> I think no, I'd rather no. hear about time. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, we can't we can't have you on here because twenty ten is essentially I I wouldn't say major, but it certainly elevated you to a, a whole new level of, of TT racing. Um you look at twenty ten and you see that you won five races and you go, right, there can't have been any competition. It's it's like let's say um when Roger Federer is is at his height, there's no one to compete against him. But you'd managed to do that while competing against, pff, what, five, six riders that all could have potentially done what you did. So it's not like you went there and dominated. So looking back now, do you have any different thoughts on it now to what you did when you won it, when you won all five? Uh, well, the, the whole sort of run to it actually came from that Rob Mack thing that I was talking mm. about uh, at the Ulster because I came back from there and uh, I can't remember if I ended up doing any short circuit after that, but... I'd sort of shook hands with Rob to do British Superbikes as Chris Walker's teammate the year after. And I was mm. like, finally, I was desperate to get into British Superbikes just to be, to be riding a big bike, you know. So that deal was done. And I went to Macau. I must have been riding one of Birdie's bikes in Macau. So I knew I had this ride, but I, I wasn't allowed to say anything. And then I came back from Macau. Michael Rutter had got sponsored by the Northwest 200 Coca-Cola thing. Yeah. And he'd gone to Rob with the money to get a bike. So I got a phone call off Rob saying, oh, uh, we're going to run uh, Michael Rutter in BSB as well. So uh, I think we'll just run you on a 600. Just crushed my dreams totally. Mm. You know, I was like, I, I sort of got this feeling it wasn't really bothered in the roads anyway. And now the super bike, I just said, just leave it, Rob. It's straight away, it just, I just knew it wasn't going to be right. You know, try to run here, my me. And probably from what I did with yeah, the 08 yeah. thing, I just thought I'm not going down that route again. This was January now. So we were at, January 09 and Honda had they said they weren't going in 08 so they didn't go to the TT at all so John rode for Paget and then Honda came back for 09 so Clive had those bikes there so I didn't know Clive never met him jumped on my push bike probably 15 mile cycle over at Batley and just said uh, oh I just wondered if you were doing anything with the bikes you rode John on last year so we had, it just happened like that, really. Clive yeah. was like, oh, could, we could do something for the roads. But we, he did British Championship as a team back then. Mm. They ran Supersport. So he already had Dennis Hobbs and somebody had maybe Webb, James Webb, maybe something like yeah. that. He was like, I'm already done for British, but we could do something on the roads. So I got very little time on the bike, never did the British Championship, and uh, went to the Northwest. I think I won 600 races at the Northwest, either stock or 600 in own. Stock? Oh, I won... I won the Super Sport and the Super Bike. There's only two races that year because of rain. Right. So it must have been the stock. Stock. Yeah. And then went to the TT and won the 600 and the stock race. And the Super Bike was really hard work that year. Really hard to ride, power-wise, the way the, the engine rode. And I'd not had much time on it anyway. So coming away from there, I sort of sat down with Clive about what we needed. And... um we ended up being the first ones to go down the 17-inch wheel route because the bike didn't handle very well. And I said to Clive, the stock is absolutely amazing. So like, why do we run 17-inch yeah. wheels? So we ended up with those in the Superbike and the different spec engine, which is what John had had that in 09 because Honda had come on with some different wear pistons or whatever. So, yeah, I did. A, we did the Castle Coombe test at... You were there because you were on the H and Plant Bike by then. You must have been. Yeah. Was this nine it's or for 10? ten? For ten, sorry, going yeah. the year after. For sorry, 10. mate. Yeah. So the, the the sort of new spec bike with the wheels and the engine and stuff wasn't built off Clive. So I was still riding the old one that I never liked, and I high sided it coming out of last car. And you remember, I crashed it at Castle Coombe, <laughs> and I was like skidding up the road, thinking this is not a good start. You mm -hmm. know, I never got hurt or anything, but you don't like crashing them super bike. I feel sad for the bikes when you crash the super yeah. bike more than anything. So yeah, then but I knew in my mind that the, the better bike was coming. You know. And I was doing super, I can't remember, I think I was doing a full season of super sport in 10. That's, that'll be, yeah, because I was Glenn Richards' teammate, yeah. Right. So Glenn was current British super sport champion from the Triumph. So, yeah, it kind of built up to being the point where the bikes were all capable of winning. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember being sat in a beer garden with a few of my mates, like the 
a few days before going to the TT and they were like, what's your best chance? I said, I literally could win on any of them bikes. They're all good enough to win and I feel pretty good riding any of them. I can't remember how the North West went. Um, but then, yeah, because I kind of came together. <laughs> it did come together. A little bit. I mean, the, the amount of skill that's involved in doing it, but the amount of luck, the fact that, you know, you weren't the one that broke down throughout the whole of the five races, it's just, it is pretty... No, you did. Yeah, we we are. Oh, sorry, yeah, we yeah, you did. Sorry, yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, of things going on. Like. Yeah, but they. But again, it always worked out in the end for you. Yeah, yeah. It's just. It's the way. That's, but that's racing, though, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you get like when we were teammates, you mm. got all the bad luck, everything. Yeah. And then, but obviously, like when when you did the five, you had some good luck on you. So you need, you always need a bit of luck for a race win, for mm -hmm. sure. You know, and you've got to be on it and riding really well, mm -hmm. especially at someone like a TT. Yeah. yeah. How did, like how did it change your life? Did it change your life? Because achieving something like that no one else has achieved before, the TT is obviously the world's greatest motorsporting event, but it's not let's say MotoGP where it's worldwide. So what what did happen after that? In I terms got of like smashed to bits at right. Silverstone <laughs> before that. Let's we're not getting into that. Hey, first of all, sorry Chris, but first of all, you know we're going back to Chris's first question: the tap on the shoulder. Yeah, so you've worked your way through to it. You've done the fours, a lot of pressure on. You know, everybody's looking at you, seeing you, obviously, the last race. Da, da, da. What was it like then at the start with the tap on the shoulder, the, the amount of pressure? Yeah, the You're same. putting on yourself as well, because obviously you wanted to do the five. Yeah, I was um, I was stopping at the Hilton Hotel. This is probably one of the reasons why I stopped stopping there, really. Like, I remember going down for breakfast and everyone just staring at me. I was, I was like, I wasn't nervous when I got up. I was, like, ready to go. I had faith in myself and the bike yeah. and... And I just felt like everybody wanted me to do it, like even more than I did. And so when it when I got up there, I was nervous. Yeah. And I can't really remember. It's quite a long time ago. But yeah, just I was definitely feeling like I'm going to let everyone down if I don't do this now. And um, we we were lucky with the fact that it got stopped because mm -hmm. I started the race and I had an oil leak. And my foot was slipping off the footrest. Soon as that was happening, I wasn't concentrating, looking down, I was in fourth place, not in the race. And then I came into the pit and I was going to retire at the pit. And then Dave Castle, the mechanic, had, had a look around. He's like, oh, it's only a bit of like residue. It's not like pouring oil out, keep going. Which was like, if he hadn't have said that, I'd have retired and we wouldn't have been allowed to restart. Yeah. So we left there and I got to Solby and it got stopped for guys crash. Mm -hmm. So by the time we all came back, I said straight away, this this oil leaking out of this bike, you know, get on it. That and was the big famous fireball, once it, was it? Yes, yeah. 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 So, yeah, obviously we got held for ages. When we heard it was Balagari, it was like, oh, my God, what's happened here? And then it got back and it was going. But before we started the race, we'd, we'd heard that he pretty much walked away from it. Mm. So, yeah, it wasn't like anything had happened to him. So, um, I... A rule I never realised when you get back to Park Fermi because it's under race thing. You can't touch the bike until thirty minutes before the start of the race. Yeah. So I was like, oh, right? oh, I need to fix it, but you can't touch yeah. it. So Clive like straight away clocked what it was with a little hairline crack in the generator cover. So he had all the parts and everything ready. As soon as we could go, I jumped on straight it, on. and that just kind of maybe without even the oil leak, I might not have won the senior because that just calmed everything down. I, I almost thought this is meant to be. I'd, yeah. had, I'd had a little couple of warm-up laps. Everything had been put at ease. You know, it was yeah. like, how can this, you know, it's all just meant to be. Yeah. And I just set off a totally different person, really. And, you know, I did, I was leading, but, like, John brought down. Uh, I think it, the last lap ended up like, a minute, because most people behind me had broken down, so the gap just kept getting bigger from people breaking down. But, yeah, it was nice, because... I just cruised around the last lap and did some wheeling. I enjoyed and, it. Yeah. Brilliant, yeah. I think back Brilliant. to that, actually. Now, like, those two years I did on the Honda, and I, the fastest lap for two years was 127. I did 127 waving and wheeling in 2010. <laughs> 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 did, like, 130, 131 or something, and then 127 waving and wheeling <laughs> all my way around. But, yeah, it was, it was just nice. I, I mean, I've never felt as completely drained and knackered in my... I came back... I think I flew to Manchester, got the train, and then got home. I just sat on myself. My grass was that big. I looked out the window, <laughs> sat on myself. I was like, "Oh my God, what's just happened?" You're always a little bit like that after the TTI because yeah. it's just yeah. mental for two yeah. weeks. But just absolutely, my my sister's coming. I just couldn't even 
like comprehend what had gone on for two weeks and yeah it was mental yeah did it like you say what happened after it but i just wondered like did it change was what am i trying to say was there any was there a difference in winning all five coming back compared to winning one or two like was there any additional press that got in touch with you yeah i mean it's it's always been if I get announced up, I get announced up as that. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's definitely changed that, and I thought I might get paid next year because I wrote for free that year. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you had a good bonus scheme in place though. <laughs> Don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't what people. I didn't earn a million quid like most people think. So yeah, it. But you know, it was life changing, as in you know, something that I've achieved. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, it's getting closer now because they keep adding races to it. Everyone's like, no one will ever do it. Well, if you've got 20 races to go out, someone's going to win five out there. <laughs> exactly. yeah. But yeah, I mean, I've done it and that's it. You know, if someone else does it or beats it, fantastic for them. Yeah. So I did it and it was, I've, I've never really, I, w- I wouldn't say people don't go there aiming to win every race, but I don't, for me before that, I've never really heard of anyone talk about going to win. There'd only ever been McCallum win four and then it was threes apart from that. You know, people had had I think, trebles. Yeah, from my time being involved in, in racing, um, the only person that would talk about doing them all would be McCallum, mm-hmm. I would say. Maybe his love on McCallum from, from years ago, you know. Because m- most riders would have a weaker class, yeah, no yeah. different to Michael Dunlop now and Hickey kind of yeah, thing, yeah. you know. Uh, same sort of thing. One's, I wouldn't say anybody's weak, but someone's got the edge at yeah, a different yeah. class. So, yeah. I think what's also changed a bit like now because you've got bikes like BMs that don't make a 600. When I did it, I did it on all three, the same manufacturer, which you never get. They're not, it's yeah. not, you know, the R6 was about back then. You know, what they're not always the strongest bikes for every class. Whereas now you can pick, like you can ride. Yeah. One bike in the super bike, one bike in the stock, one bike in the pick. You can pick all the best, basically, is what I'm trying pick, to say. Yeah, <laughs> pick what you think is the best package yeah. to, to get on. Which, yeah. which makes what you did even, I guess, even a bigger achievement. The fact that you were on, you were on the bikes, and that was that. Whether yeah. they're competitive or not, I, suppose I think you it's made nice that it was for one team. Yeah, I was just going to say, and, and the team major yeah. achievement as well. You know, especially the team you were with, like Paget's is synonymous yeah. with the, uh, yeah. the T2. If anyone deserves to get that Absolutely. as a team, I think it's them as well as 100%. me. 100%, yeah, yeah. Um, the only thing I want to touch on with with what happened beyond that is is more your mental state of how you got through what you got through. Everyone knows about your injuries. Everyone knows how many times you bloody broke your leg and, and how much shorter it is now. But I remember, because I came around to your house to film some stuff for RST and you had your cage on in 20... When was that? 26, 2017. Yeah. And you were as you are now. And you, you've mentioned it in your other interviews, you had low days. But how low did it get? And was there any points you ever can I don't want to say like depression, but did you ever suffer any of that where you were like, I just can't see any way out of this? Like, I'm never going to get back to racing. I'm never going to get back to how life was. Yeah, I think... what. One sort of cruel thing with bike racing is if you're not in the paddock, you're not racing. You know, no, mm-hmm. you've forgotten about it in a breath. If you're not in everyone's face all the time or on a screen all the time, timing screen or whatever. Yeah. So when you're, if you haven't got a ride and you're in that situation, it's bad enough. But if you're sat at home injured, sort of moping around and in pain and doctors meetings all the time and x-ray this, x-ray that. And, you know, it's, it's tough to get through. And um, it was just the drive to come back. You know, I'd sort of, I didn't feel like I'd peaked, but I'd had a very short time doing it and got mm-hmm. to that point and had some, like, kickbacks on the way and, you know, it'd sort of finally come my way and I thought, I need to, you know, I'm not giving in at this. You see it through. Yeah, so I just straight away got on with these, like, making pedals for my mountain bike and, you know, I was doing all the things that my surgeon was a little bit, ooh, uh, it was, mm-hmm. all, it was yeah. all for me pushing it, but some stuff it was like maybe a bit early. You know, and since then, it's almost become, I, as soon as someone smashes a leg, it's pretty much certain I'll get a Instagram message. I don't really look at the private message on Instagram, but, you know, I do sometimes, and, you know, someone will message me that and they're going through this, whatever, you know, and I'll do my best. I mean, it's hard to help everybody, and I can't send everybody to Mr. Kirkovich because <laughs> <laughs> Cambridge have got no budget left. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, it's nice to be able to say this works, this don't work, 
do this. But every injury is different and you have to sort of listen to your own body and, you know, if it isn't happy, it don't want to do it, it don't want to do it. You know, I've, I've done all the, like, weights with a frame on and cycling with a frame on, swimming with a frame on, but you can't do it at some points, you know, it's too bad to do stuff like that. And But I think, um, yeah, just just the thought of getting back to it is all that really pushed me to keep going with it. Yeah, that's yeah. I suppose if you haven't got that and you'd you'd hung up your your levers and you went, that's it. It could have been a, I guess it could have been a completely different story trying to get through that without that in mind. Thinking right, bang, I want to get back on the bike. Yeah. And when when you run through all of that time, you know when because obviously you know from from watching from the side, you was you was there and you was doing parade laps with a cage on and this and that. Did, I, did you honestly think because when you come back, you come back really on it, you know, mm. um, winning again. Mm-hmm. you know and, and uh on on kind of any bike any class did you think all the way through was that in your mindset you would be just as strong when you got back yeah i just i thought i need to keep everything rolling so i did like all the changing the gear shifter right hand side rode a raptor quad with it because i couldn't ride a bike yeah. uh did the parade lap straight away to try to keep my mind on the tt went way too fast the only thing that kind of Annoys me now is I wish we'd put the right hand gear shift on because I'd have got I'd have got more out of that parade lap. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to shift gear with a frame on with a left hand gear shift. I snapped it off in the end because I couldn't even feel my foot. It's a so parade. It was a parade lap. Yeah, but I needed to be going. <laughs> That's a racer, isn't it, right there? <laughs> I wanted to get something out of a yeah. parade lap. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good picture of me coming through, Kurt Michael. The RST had made me the suit that Velcro. It's chopped yeah. off at the knee. Velcroed up to my crotch to get the frame over. And then we just wrapped a piece of leather around the frame and Velcroed it. I mean, if you'd had a crash, <laughs> Jesus Christ. So I'm coming through Kurt Michael. I watched him set off. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. The shops in the background at Kurt Michael. I'm coming around, went over with this frame. It like it lifted. My leathers had lifted off my knee. So you can see a bare knee, the top of my frame. <laughs> it's just, yeah, make a little picture. Fully on it. Fully on it through Kurt Michael. <laughs> and I kept having to try to do a wave, so it made it look like I was on a parade. But I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, everything was just, like, keeping my mind on getting back racing. Even, like, when I, when I fell out with Sean about him missing my entry from Macau, you know, I'd, every single minute I'd spent in the gym was to get me to Macau. My, like, just keep going because you're racing in November. You're racing in November. So when he told me in September he'd missed it, I could have literally killed the guy. Mm, nothing to, nothing yeah, yeah. personal to him, I could have killed him. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it just... Yeah, I think you've just got to set your mind on something. And even then, when you come back, you go through a horrible patch of being nervous of falling on it again because you don't want another setback. It's not mm-hmm. It's not like you're nervous of falling. You don't want to break that again. Yeah. It's too soon, you know, yeah. and then lose another year. So you've got to do, you've got to get the results because you're still riding for a decent team. You want to get the results. They want you to get results, but you don't want to go back again. So you like so much balancing riding a bike at that state, especially in British Championship when you've got other people to trust as well. Yeah. And I feel like <clears throat> people try to take a bit advantage of the situation thinking he won't want to fall off and they're the first yeah. ones to dart underneath you and give you a nudge thinking, oh, I'll keep out of his way. Yeah. And in 16, I had to actually fight back a bit. That's where I thought, right, I need to prove I don't give a shit here because I'm getting beaten up a bit. And we had a race at Brands Indy Circuit and Buchan and Richard Cooper dropped back from Superbike into Superstock and all I heard was that they were going to win the championship, they are going to be off like fucking blah, blah, blah. And we were having a battle. Was Adam Jenkinson was in it as well at Brands. And, uh, yeah, I was getting beaten up and I just gave a massive portion back to a couple of them, rode into the side of them and thought, Fuck if, if I come off, I'll come off. Yeah. I can't keep going like this. And I won the race, you know. So... It, it, there's a lot more than just an injury when you come back from something as big as that. Yeah. Where where does the mindset come from though? Because that is, again, like I've had I've had small injuries, but I remember getting hit on my bike as a bike. What? I, I'm not saying I'm on the same. I'm not. Hey. I was lost a bit of skin of his knee. <laughs> I, bro- <laughs> I, bro- I broke a rib. <laughs> I'm not shoulder blind. I bet you big that up with a pint in your hand, yeah. don't you? <laughs> but I was like, again, I did that this year. <laughs> Before TT, <laughs> don't surprise me. Mm. Um, but again, you, you've got things that you, you you're looking at a year down the line. I was looking like three months to come back, and I was like really getting upset and and stressed about it. So where does that mindset come from? Is that like 
was it ingrained from the, that, a younger the first, age or the, the first crash at Silverstone? So I uh, I did treat that as a three month cycle. Really. Well, from the start, I never knew anything. I'd only ever broken a collarbone in my life. And yeah. I had it played and rode in Macau ten days after, so I'd never really got round this injury. How long it would take? But obviously, when your legs hanging out of your body on turn one at Silverstone, oh. it ain't going to be a three month. I just no. googled tibia, broken <laughs> tibia, three months. So that was me, right? Three months, I'm back. Good old Google. Yeah, so by the time I'd had half my tibia removed and my fibia removed and all that, it wasn't going to be three months, but yeah. I just kept going, oh, another three months. Just kept adding three months on, really, and working to that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think I think the surgeon did actually mention that it was going to be a, a long... I don't know how, what time scale, but I just blanked it out completely as three months. So if he'd have actually sat me down and gone, you, you're going to be, like, 18 months before this is even like cobbled together really I'd, could have cracked you you could have probably given in yeah just to think i can't go through that for the you know it was proper proper torture doing growing a new leg torture <laughs> <laughs> what was um going back to mum and dad you know what was their opinion of you trying to get yourself ready again because obviously they've seen the bigger picture no um well they've never liked road racing they, 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 they come, they've always come and enjoyed it. And, you know, my mum's petrified of it, was was petrified of it. But uh, I think I, there was a moment when I'd, I'd had three weeks or something at Coventry with the big smashed up part of it sort of being put together and framed. And then I came home for a bit and then all the skin had died because uh, there was no blood supply. So then I went to BRI at Bradford to... Um, a plastic surgeon there and he'd done a 16 hour op and I was in a bad way like grafted took a little skin off my thigh and grafted it on covering my leg at the bottom and I was laid in intensive care and um, my dad had come in my mum must have gone to the toilet and I mentioned to my dad about riding for uh, <laughs> <laughs> riding for short mirror <laughs> and he's like you honestly want to ride again? Look at you. Like, these scars I've got in my mouth here, these were from, the ops were so long, the pipe that comes out, it had, like, m like melted my skin or something. So these were just, like, big red wounds at the time. Then the first, the graft failed, so I had to rip it off the day after and do another 16-hour op and take it off my back. Put it hell? back so I did another pipe that side. <laughs> so when it come in, I had these two things. I must have just looked horrendous. And I had this great big, things stitched into my neck there where they get into your main artery because they yeah. can tape blood or put stuff in mm -hmm. rather than if it's anywhere else they can't yeah. once they've injected something in they can't take so this thing with cables and wires hanging out of it my scars <laughs> I can't look very good and yeah I'm talking about speaking to Sean Muir <laughs> I think it was all the uh, morphine and what have you asked I was really um I started crying whenever I spoke it wasn't because I was upset I just when I heard my own voice it I, I started crying yeah I said, I need to speak to Sean Muir, but I can't stop fucking crying when I talk. <laughs> <laughs> I said, he's not going to sign me talking like that, is he? <laughs> so I'd have these little practice chats with him to try and get myself out of this talking thing. Anyway, I said, whatever you do, don't mention coming back to your mum. She's not ready for that. So, yeah, I just remember that then. His face, my dad's face. He gave me the face when I was naughty as a kid, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just give me that yeah. face. I thought, oh, <laughs> like your mum is not ready for that now. And I know I put my mum through a lot like so yeah, she would have been quite happy if I'd packed in and never come back after that. Yeah. Yeah, but moving forward, twenty fifteen you ended up winning. Twenty sixteen you ended up winning. Um but I want to talk about this rivalry with Michael Dunlop because I didn't really understand I told you not to mention that. Sorry, was I not supposed to mention that? Egg. You said mention it and watch him. <laughs> Watch him flip. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> Talk to us about that. He's a lovely lad as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it, it, well, it came about all from us both being on the same bike in yeah. in 16, obviously. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Uh, don't like to be beaten by the same bike. <laughs> So, but yeah, I got beat by the same bike as well at the same time, you know. So mm -hmm. we both had our wins that year, but it obviously came to a bit of a head in the end. And we were both getting help. Like BMW, the way they work is they'll come and help everybody that's riding a BMW in the paddock. They don't care whether you're a factory team, non-factory team. So we were both sort of semi-factory, if you call it that, yeah. Tass and Hawk, you know, and um, came and helped us both. And that was how it was, really. And yeah, the, 
never really had a chat since. <laughs> we had a little chat on, on the podium at the Ulster, and then that is the end of it. Really? <laughs> yeah. What, a negative one? Um, I thought it was probably time we should just shake hands and move on, but never went that way, so... <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Hey, well, no, two strong-minded characters, obviously. But just, yeah, yeah, I sort of felt at the Ulster that uh, everyone else was gaining at more out of it than us because like, I turned up at the Ulster and straight away all the newspapers and headlines were just about me and him, me and him, me and yeah, him. Yeah. You know, I was like, unless we're going to gain something out of this, you know, we're just making it better for everyone else. So. But, yeah, that was that. Do you think that, yeah, again, yeah, do you think that's because you, you, were, you were fighting... And I guess it's like Pete and and Dean nowadays, but they seem to have a slightly uh, friendly relationship. I guess. Um, did you get on with him beforehand, or had you had much to do with him? He, ne never really. I mean, I'd spoke to him, and like you mm -hmm. know, there was never ever an issue. And I still, you know, I never wanted there to be an issue. Yeah. Um, just the the playing on the privateer thing as the team when when. A lot of the time when we wanted the guy from BMW to come and plug into our bike and help us, it, it was in their garage. So, yeah. you know, uh, sort of bashing the privateer drum in the um, press conference after was a little <laughs> bit rich. So, because <laughs> even that, even in the press conference, you were you were contemplating not coming back to the TT. Was that just was that just talk or? Yeah, I uh, can't remember what was that about. Because I, um, I think I watched it. Um, because it was talk about the Michael Dunlop thing, and you were saying depending how the the organisers, um, if the organisers sort it out for next year, whether I'll be back or not. Can't remember what happened there then. That was about the oversight. No, you just pistons, said the organisers need to take a look at what's going on. That was it. Yeah, with the scrutineering. There, there've been, there've oh, been yeah, issues yeah. with the super sport and mm -hmm. various things. Yeah. yeah so scrutineers had like uh, wanted something measuring up for the pistons, and then. The bikes were all taken apart side by side, so everyone's in one room. Yeah. And then one one rider ran off and got a protest put in because he heard the word piston, and then before you knew it, the whole thing was round that we had oversized pistons. And ah, right. So yeah, it just it just spoiled the whole job, you know, when you've won, and then you, yeah, it wasn't anything that it passed scrutineering, but then you're under a cloud walking away from TT, the three time winner that mm -hmm. year, and people questioning something. So yeah, I, I and now like the scrutineering things all done individually <laughs> like it should be because you shouldn't be able to look at other people's bikes anyway the scrutineers are doing the job mm -hmm. yeah you know so yeah they did change the way they did it so then 17 we had some highs and again some lows let's talk about the highs you ended up winning again yeah um so we're the same team as well with tas yeah got on with those boys yeah it's been really good you know um those those two years were like great years good fun racing with them mm -hmm. British Championship and that and started the year in British Championship with that race that I said at Brands Ulton went proper pear shaped it's like I've always had Ulton as one of my best tracks and then for a good few years now it's, I've had disastrous races there but we ended up with a it was a drying track for the race there the one before the North West and we were in I think he must have got stopped or something we came in and I was like we need to be on dries and we're on wet Philip was against me he never ever gets involved and he was against me no no I said, put a dry rear in, put a dry rear in. It's all that we had time for. It was like a minute to go somewhere, put a dry rear in, went out, and it was a dry track. So I had a wet front dry rear, <laughs> led for a bit, and then finished about 14th. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, not ideal. But um, then we went into Northwest. I can never remember the Northwest, you know. <laughs> anyway, we That's raced at the Northwest, and then we came away from there, and then we went to the TT. <laughs> Won the superbike race. Yeah. The start, I, I changed the Dunlop tyres that year. Mm -hmm. so yeah I'd, I'd had the battles in 16 I was struggling with the super bike still and I had a good bike obviously I had the same bike as what Michael was on and McGuinness had followed me for a good bit in the race in 16 I said to him what do you think I said my bike's like loose Wait, you know what do you think looking at it and he'd said tyres flexing everywhere you're just like you're out the seat you're out you know mm. and Michael's never did that when he because he was in front of him as well we were all together on the road I was like, right, I'm going to have to give the, the tyre job a go, you know. So I went to 17. It was a bad year to do it because practice week got cut down. Yeah. I was literally riding the same bike that I'd rode in 16, except it had been stolen, but built exactly the same in the Superstock race. Done 133 standing start in 16 and did 131 or something in 17 and won the race still by quite yeah. a bit, you know, but because of the weather. and So I never really got to get a good go at the Dunlop tyre thing. And then um, we had the... 
thing that happened on the mountain in the senior. What, so happened, on, what happened on the mountain in when the I crashed? <laughs> uh, so, what do you know about that crash in terms of what happened? Don't really know because that's not the twenty seventh. Was yeah. it twenty seventh? Was it? Um, no, twenty seventh early in it. It's the the bridge going onto the mountain mile. That's right. I don't know what yeah, that so, chaff yeah. to go through is. Mm. So on Mad Sunday, back when you were seventeen, you could probably see that crash happening. Doing that, being a mad eye. I've never but, even contemplated that corner before. And yeah. Then, and then David Morgan died there this year. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's it's been one of them corners that I mean, the only thing that stands out for that corner is that the wall on the inside sticks out. That's the only thing you sort of concentrate on. Is like mm -hmm. you can't go in too early because the wall sticks out. Apart from that, you don't even treat it as a corner, do you? No. Yeah. But I never even got to the corner. To be fair, that year I come round the left, and as I was changing direction from the left to the right, it had gone then. Yeah. Like before I'd even got there. Had it? Yeah. It was, early, it was like a weird feeling. I was like, you know, sometimes when you're changing direction, you get that cross bar feeling yeah. as your wheels off the ground. But that's when you're accelerating hard. Obviously, you're not you, you're tramping there. It's like third or fourth, fourth yeah, gear, yeah. probably. So it wasn't off the ground, but it felt like it was. So it turned. It was almost like it was steering on someone's oil or something. Mm. I was like, there's nothing I could do. I couldn't roll. There's nothing. You know, I was, I was just going to a wall. So a guy sent me, he stood watching it, filmed it, and he went back and took a picture of him behind because the black line was off, like nowhere near the apex. Mm. So yeah, just. Spoiled my day. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and then spoiled the, the the coming months as well. Yeah, yeah. Do, again, like you ended up breaking your your femur and your ankle, but your tibia didn't end up breaking. How does that How does that manage to happen? I don't know. I think it's that thick now. It's like <laughs> it's like concrete. <laughs> but having said that, it broke last year without even a motorcycle racing incident. So hold on, this sounds like a story. How do you do it? Somebody fell on it drunk. Did they? Mm. Yeah, New Year's Eve. Bloody hell. Snapped it, come straight out my leg, back in for an operation, another frame on. Did it? Mm. <laughs> Dangerous, that drinking laugh, isn't it? <laughs> you hit that well, didn't you? <laughs> I did hide it well, yeah, because we were in lockdown, so... <laughs> well, there you go. Didn't have to see anybody for a long yeah. time. Bloody heck. Yeah, it was a tight one, because I was riding for uh, the Edward Yamaha team, and they wanted to do a, the team launch and the pictures... So there was only one person that I let know, and that was Chris Anderson, my mechanic. Mm. So he just happened to keep forgetting to take the bodywork for painting every week. Oh, brilliant. And he managed to stretch it out for three months. <laughs> and then he's like, <laughs> no, mate, I've got to get your bodywork painted. They want to do the press launch next week. So I was like, fuck it. So I went for the x-ray on the Monday. My surgeon said, I wouldn't really be taking your frame off now, but if you want it off, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it'll just snap straight away, but, you know... I was like, yep, take it off. He goes, right, I'll get you booked in for theatre next week. I said, no, theatre? I said, like, I need it off. I've got my press launch on Wednesday. Like, how do you want me to take it off then? I said, well, can you not do it today? He said, we could do it in clinic if you want to just... I'll chop the wires and take it off while you're awake. I was like, oh, you fucker. <laughs> so I said, well, get one wire chopped and let's see what it feels like. <laughs> Anyway, I just sat there and gritted my teeth. She kept trying to pass me the uh, gas and air thing. I said, honestly, there's no point giving me that. It's a waste of time, that stuff. <laughs> so he took it off? Took it off were... Monday afternoon. And then I went to the press launch on the Wednesday. And then the following Monday, we were at Silverstone for a damp, cold test. And nobody oh, yeah. knew, and I was nervous, to I say the least. Yeah. <laughs> Coming out of the last turn, pinned in fifth gear sideways in a damp, wet track, thinking, fucking hell, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> so the, t the team didn't even know? No. Bloody hell. Do they know now? Yeah, Did I think you tell some them? of them do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Right, so um, moving on, 2018, 2019, obviously factory, uh, factory Honda. A dream for some people. But again, I think I remember you saying that it was um, it was quite good the way it happened in terms of you moving you moving away from task because you weren't too sure how you were going to get on and what results you were going to get. So what, how was the experience there? Yeah, it was all right. I mean, um, Johnny Towers was the guy running it, so it wasn't like the team that I'd rode for before and it wasn't the team that are running now, but um, I got on well with him. And, and, you know, they listened to stuff that I said we needed, got what we needed, um, and I think, you know, it was an ageing bike and I don't think that model was it at its peak as far mm -hmm. as what bikes have come on to. But, um, you know, it felt to be doing everything I wanted it to, really. And we, 
they'd gone against doing the British Championship and sort of used the Dunlop tyres as an excuse for that, I think, and said, oh, there's no point because you can't run Dunlop tyres. We'll do some French super bike rounds. We were supposed to do two or three. We did one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so like we could have probably put more into it at the start of the year. I went and did the French one at Le Mans and um, I did okay first race and the bike was lap times were showing like we could have had a lot better race and I got stuck in in race two I was like fourth or fifth in the turn one and then some bell end wiped me out from behind <laughs> so that was the end of that so I went all the way to France for one race and then we came back did the Castle Coombe test and that was it went to the northwest so mm -hmm. there wasn't much build up to it really but and then the northwest was a complete washout yeah yeah. There was no track time, there was a wet track or no real track time. So I feel for Honda a bit on that side because, you know, it, sh it all should have been better. Definitely should have been better in, in 18 than it was. I'm not saying we were going to go and win races, but, um, you know, Devo got a podium on the stocker and, you know, it showed. I, I went faster on my stocker at Castle Coombe than he went on his superbike. So, you know, I was riding good. Mm. So I felt oh, I should have been on that podium. Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, I never even did the stock race because of having the crash um, in the first night of practice, I never qualified the stock. I had only done one lap on it, mm. so I never even raced it. We went and watched at Gorsley, but no, at um, Hillbury. So, yeah, it was just, and my 600 blew up in both races. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, uh, again. <laughs> seems a funny place, that. It seems to blow hot and cold, people jumping off at the TT now. What, what do you mean for... Uh, uh, the 11th. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, the way I had the crash that night, I, I've, it, again, it's a corner. I've never, ever even contemplated that you could fall off that. Never not even a thought. Dangerous you, issue. You're only yeah. half yeah. length. You're not even at yeah. full lean. You just run through it. Whereas, you know, if you think, if you if you lost the front going into Glen Ellen, backshifting and really pushing for a race win, you'd, you'd go, well, yeah, that could happen there. You know, yeah. you're loading the front, you're pushing hard, you're treating it like a short circuit. Never even contemplated. So when it went there, I was properly baffled and then had to ride through it for the rest of the week, you know. Scared, without an scared idea of how it Yeah, yeah. I'm scared yeah. of it. So when I got there this year and saw that it was brand new black tarmac, it was like, Phew. yeah, that's it, fixed. They've obviously realised there was an issue. <laughs> and then Michael Sweeney crashed there. Yeah. I'm thinking, fucking hell, mm. what is wrong with that corner? And then McGuinness reeled off about five people that have crashed there. So it's something very strange. I mean, there is a very slight dip as you go around, and whether it's because you're just driving the throttle as you go through, but I mean, you shouldn't be tucking the front at half lean corners in no. fourth gear, should you fifth gear, whatever it is. Bloody hell. Very strange. Right, Steve, before we get onto your quickfire questions, what's the future hold for you? 42 now, not a day over. You don't look a day over 21, <laughs> to be fair. 43 next month. Uh, bloody hell. Yeah, forty-three, <laughs> and, and still there, still doing it. Are you looking at John and thinking, "I can go till I'm 50. Do no, you want to go to your fifty? I don't want to go till I'm fifty. I just want to win some more, but um, not when I'm fifty. <laughs> 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 do you think? You, do you think you're still capable of winning? Yeah, if you can get on the competitive bike, you have that look again. Yeah, this year, I mean, uh, the results weren't what I wanted, but I know how I was riding, and what was like not was losing his time and stuff, you yeah. know, and it wasn't down to me not being ready for it anymore and stuff. So, yeah, there's definitely more to come. All right, then, we'll leave it there. Steve, give us your quick fires. Right, quick fire questions. Just just 10 questions, mate. One one or the other answer. You don't have to give any explanations. Beer or wine? Get bad guts with beer, so I'll say wine. Pineapple or no pineapple on the pizza? I can eat that, actually. Hawaiian. I love it. Every now and then. Mass start or time trial? There's only one place for a time trial. The best is mass start, isn't it? We've got to choose. Yeah. I like a mass start, but I like the TT, so it's time trial. Then. <laughs> David Todd or Glenn Irwin? To do what? Could a lot. <laughs> you can read it. You can read it in any way, shape you want to. I just want the answer, one or the other. Oh dear. David Todd or Glenn Irwin. McGuinness struggled to answer this last weekend. Yeah, mm. they're both in different, uh, depending on what you're doing. I'll say Todd then, because I just had good wood with him. <laughs> Grandstand to Balacrane or the bungalow to Crankamona. 
Grandstand to Ballacrane, bungalow. Probably Grandstand to Ballacrane. Okay, Superbike or Superstock? I'd like to get a bit of time on a Superbike one day, <laughs> and then I'd enjoy riding it, but for now I'd say Superstock. <laughs> Another senior win or outright TT lap record? Senior win. West Yorkshire or the Isle of Man? Depends what I'm doing again. I want to spend a winter in the Isle of Man. Oh, and it's not much better in West Yorkshire, is it? <laughs> True. West Yorkshire, through and through. John McGuinness or the late, great DJ? My DJ. TT race team manager or professional helicopter pilot? <laughs> Tell you what, helicopter pilot being a professional is not what it's cracked up to be. <laughs> What's your there, TT? TT race team manager. Yeah, that, that's, that's not easy either, is it? But I'll go with that. Right. That'll do. Nice. I remember I did some quick fires with him at um, RST. One of my questions was uh, favourite corner, and he said, um, "I don't know if you remember, you were like Brayel." I said, "Brayel, is that a corner?" <laughs> he flipped out. <laughs> a corner? <laughs> you want to go down there at this speed and try tell me it's not a corner? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a corner. Favourite corner still, Bra Brayel? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so, yeah. Nice one. Uchi, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm sure there's another three or four parts in this one for uh, for the listeners, isn't there? Yeah, and by the way, I'm not riding pillion with you. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, pal. No Thanks, worries. mate. Cheers. Hey up, Steve. Crack in my eyes, one of the best episodes so far. We got way more out of Ruchi than I thought we were we were gonna. Yeah, nice and relaxed, you know, and just talking about his lifestyle, brilliant. You know, it's uh and I think really for the listeners, something quite different for a change. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that stuff there that one he probably is he's never said, you know, to the media. Uh, and two, that the the story about him in uh, Macau was was just <laughs> just hilarious. <laughs> I think it was quite kind there. <laughs> Did you think more more went on? Oh yeah, without doubt. Yeah. <laughs> and this has been the second part of episode 14 of the TT podcast. If you've enjoyed it, then please hit that subscribe button and make sure you leave us a review because Steve reads them all. He's clearly not busy enough. There are plenty more names from the world of the TT on the way for you in this series. And here's a little taste of what you can expect from our next guest, TV's very own Matt Roberts. To be fair, like I said, I wasn't massively into motorcycle racing before I started working. Yeah. Again, that imposter syndrome of being in a paddock where you don't really know anybody and you're looking up to these guys and they don't know who you are. And, you know, at the time, the likes of Steve, uh, Guy Martin, Cam, John McGuinness, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's intimidating. You know, it was it was intimidating. You're just in awe. Like, I'm, you know, I still am. That episode will be out next week and don't forget you can get all the latest TT news and features over at iomttracers.com and be sure to check us out on all the usual socials. We are at TT Racers Official. Thanks for listening.